Joining us now on the TSN MMA show, he is the vice president of athlete development for the UFC and a former UFC light heavyweight champion, Forrest Griffin. Forrest, thanks so much for joining me. Another thing that I noticed was that the recommended fight night weight is within 10% of the contracted weight class. So at UFC 227, the, uh, the California State Athletic Commission disclosed the fight night weights, and only 25% of the fighters were within that weight. Is there anything being developed to try and get more fighters within that threshold for fight night? Well, yes, there is. And that is a much larger conversation that, that I'd, I'd probably be uh, remiss if I tried to, to go too far into. But, yeah. One, one of the things, too, and we, we don't have these numbers unfo- yet. Um, unfortunately, we, we would have liked to include them in the journalists. What, what uh, weight, fight night weight, does not equal winning. So the heavier opponent doesn't win, per se. So it's really about finding your level of comfort within that 10 to 12% so that you're able to train and you're able to live right that week and you know, not, not, uh, again, you know, people always say it's like two fights, you know, you fight to make the weight and then you fight the fight. Well, it doesn't have to be, but take some of that stress off. It's very weird. It seems like this year's kind of a statistical anomaly. A lot of the fighters that are missing weight are winning fights. Whereas historically I, I thought that a lot of the fighters that had missed weight yeah. were losing fights. Is that just kind of a weird outlier this year? It is. I mean, let's look at specific instances like a Mackenzie Dern or something. You know, I think you, you have to take it. Uh, you have to take it fight per fight. You know, um, but with that said, overall the higher weight, even with those those missed weights included, is not indicative of a win. Uh, Dana White recently mentioned he wants to go back to the old way in time. Have you and your team been consulted about this? And what do you personally think of that? Again, that, that's part of a larger uh, concern. There's, there's pros and cons to it. Um, so, of course, I'm being diplomatic about it. But the, the pro to that is that you're, the closer the weight to the actual fight, the more of a true weight that is and the less time you're going to have to get these huge rebounds. Um, what does that mean? If you, if you kind of reverse engineer that, it means – you're going to cut from less. So the idea is, you know, it, it's just simply weight classes. You know, it's not about defeating or beating or being the biggest person in the weight class. It's finding the right weight class for you, for your body type. What do you, how big can you actually be on fight night? And how are you going to, what are you going to feel that you're best at? You know, finding your key for performance as opposed to, you know, I just want to be the bigger guy, by three, four pounds, whatever. Um, so yeah. What do you think is the best solution? Like if, if, if Forrest Griffin was, you know, they said Forrest Griffin, you need to come up with a solution for this weight cutting situation. What, what do you, what would you engineer as being the best, the best solution as someone who has fought before? Well, so unfortunately I'm, you know, uh, well, that's, that's the mission thing, first of all, but I, I feel like, uh, I, I'm not sure that I have the perfect answer for that. Uh, I know California proposed that if you weren't within 10%, you couldn't fight for a belt. If you weren't in within 10% of fight night, that was a California proposal, I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't hate it. I, I think if you stop the two, three, four guys that can fluctuate that 20, 30 pounds in that 20 hour period. So I think making the weight classes, I guess, you know, after I've talked through it, I think making the weigh-in closer to the actual fight is more indicative of a true weight, right? Yeah, well, I always thought that doing it Thursday night would make the most sense, but uh, after after Thursday talking, night. yeah, after 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 having spoken okay, to you Thursday about it previously, <laughs> after having spoken to you about it yeah. previously, you you kind of swayed me the other it. way. Yeah, if, if you do it like a Thursday night. I'm going to say, look, I have two full days to recover. I can destroy myself all day Thursday, you know? So I'm going to, I'm going to drop God knows how much. And then I'm going to be, again, that's just hard on your system, man. And over time it destroys your metabolism and it really hurts you. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I, I you know what, Here, here's my new thing. Just make the weight. I don't really care how you do it. <laughs> um, just make the weight. Not that hard. Find the right weight class for yourself. Um, it's probably a little verboten to me to say, but I wouldn't hate more weight classes. The argument about more weight classes is that people would naturally think, well, if I, I fight at 170, that's 
hard, but I could probably make 155, right? So then you start thinking, um, you know, that that's a counter argument to more weight classes. Yeah, and I've heard that always before. Gonna be, you're always going to be the biggest guy in the smallest weight class. Size matters. So. And what has the PI learned about brain rehydration? Because I, from what I had heard, the optimal amount of time to rehydrate your brain was 48 hours. That's kind of why I thought the Thursday night would have made the most sense. So where'd you hear that? Give me. So yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's exactly it. Like you, you, you can give me that study. Uh, so here here's the way. So I've worked with some of the best uh, brain surgeons, neurologists, neuropathy guys, whatever. Um, here's the thing about there's no change. This is a small study, but there's no change in cerebral spinal fluid. So the idea that uh, dehydrated brain is more susceptible to concussion, that, that's based off the fact that your hydration brain volume is going to be lower. Even in extreme dehydration, your brain volume doesn't shrink. The other thing that any most um, brain surgeons will tell you, most, you know, um, is the brain is the most valuable part of the body. It is going to be the last thing to dehydrate, and it is going to be the first thing to rehydrate. Does that make sense? It, it does, if that's what the studies say. I, I I haven't really had a chance to read up on a lot of the different studies, and it seems like there are a lot of different studies that have come out on this that have different... Uh, no, no, no. I don't know. I, I mean, send them my way, but I haven't seen... I, so I thought, I went into this thinking, yeah, dehydration definitely makes you more susceptible to concussion. And I think a lot of fighters feel that way. You know what else makes you more susceptible to get knocked out? Four-ounce gloves. A guy that's trying to hit you as hard as he can, a guy that's trying to knock you out, the stress of fight week, a lot of things will make you more susceptible to get knocked out. Um, and, you know, so I think saying, oh, the weight cut was involved, that's why I got knocked out, that's, you know, that, that's kind of an invalid conclusion there. There's a lot of other uh, variables that aren't being controlled. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, and I'm happy that the uh, the PIR consulted with a lot of different uh, neuroscientists to to get to the bottom of that because I've heard a lot of different things. I I don't really know. Again, this isn't my field of expertise uh, like it is yours, so that's why I like picking your brain on this and, and finding out what you've learned. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard a lot of different things too. But when when you say cool, where's the doctor that published the study? What was the sample size? How did they do it? You know, I work with a lot of smart people, and um, you can't. You can't find the ones that'll that'll fool Duncan and Roman and Clint and, and the guys here at the PI that, that do this for a living. So I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. I'm I'm again I'm open to the idea that, that there's a correlation, but there's nothing remotely proven as of yet. One thing that you do on a weekly basis is the rankings report. You and Megan O'Levy put this together. Um I've been a, a very um strong advocate of changing the ranking system. I, I find that a lot of the different people that are submitting these rankings aren't keeping up with the sport. If you look at their individual ballots, what, do you agree with me in, in that sense? And uh, I know that when you're presenting the ranking report, you guys are just updating on what's happening with the rankings, but do you feel like another, I guess the system could be tweaked? So there's two things. The rankings are a little confusing, right? Because the rankings are indicative of your past, um, your, your, your past record, right? So, uh, you know, a guy could be ranked higher than another guy, yet, the betting odds will be against that athlete. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And sometimes that's the case because a guy wins three or four fights because he had favorable matchups. He had a short notice fight. He beat guys that were ranked relatively high, so he's ranked higher. And then he fights someone that isn't ranked as high, but he's a bad matchup. You know, um, it'll be interesting to see this uh, Gaethje Vic fight. Are either of them ranked? They're, yeah, they're, they're both. both. Yeah, they're both ranked. Like, mm -hmm. What are they like? They're both. They're both in the top. Yeah, they're both like in the top twelve, if I recall. Okay. All right. So yeah, it, it's interesting. I always, it's always interesting to me when you see the rankings and then you see the Vegas odds. Um, so you know, again, the rankings just, just like the weigh-ins. It's another thing. I started like these are garbage. These don't work. We got to do it better. And then the more I spent researching and looking into it, the more I said, you know what? I don't really have a better way to fix the system. And 90% of the time, I agree with it. Are they wrong sometimes? Yeah. I think there should be, you should fall more in the rankings for inactivity. Well, my issue, you know? my I, issue I, with it is who's doing it. Like, you've got different writers doing yeah. it who could have a vested interest yeah. in it. Like, there's a guy who has Adriano Martins ranked as the ninth 
uh, ninth best lightweight in the UFC right now, and he's not in the UFC. And as every week you look at his, his submissions, and he's got Larissa Pacheco, who hasn't fought in the UFC and was 0-2 in the UFC ranked, and she hasn't fought in there in three years. And he's got Adriano Martins ranked in the top 10. These are things that I think yeah. need to be weeded out in order to have a fair ranking system okay. because with Paul Felder back at UFC yeah, 223, they, they wouldn't let him fight Khabib because he wasn't ranked, and he was the only guy that made 155 pounds. Yeah, well, and that's yeah, that's that's weird too. That was the New York thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you you obviously found one guy that needs to be taken out of there. <laughs> yeah. That guy out of there. He's voting on the wrong people. That's an easy win. Yeah. Another person moved Demetrius Johnson down to thirteenth pound for pound. Like it, these are kind of these are things that, from the outside looking in, I, I think are confusing. And I also yeah. think that as as somebody covering the sport. It, you know, you're dealing with managers, you're dealing with different people, you can become friendly with people, and that can create a bias. You know, I spoke to KJ Johnson yeah. about this, and he, he says that he thinks Fight Matrix is a good way of doing it. They have a, a, a numerical system that would determine the rankings. And to me, I think that makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Now we're, now we're going to have to go over exactly what they're ranking it on, you know? I mean, maybe Justin Gaethje is ranked the highest because he has the most volume output, but he's not winning fights. Right, yeah, in terms of the formula. They'd have to obviously try to perfect this formula. But if you look at FightMatrix.com, their rankings seem to add up in terms of where guys actually should be ranked, which is kind of interesting. Well, so it's funny you say that. So the rankings that are out right now are pretty close to the way uh, athletes should be ranked right now that, that, are, that just came out, you know, that come out every, what, Tuesday or, or Wednesday or whatever, right? They're always... Relative, there's, you can always find one or two to argue about, but because there's a sample size of 50, um, they're, they're still pretty accurate. So I'll tell you this, they're right a lot more than they're wrong. Yeah, especially I think at the top. I think if you look at the top five, they are where they should be. It's more, I think, in, in the lower part, I guess the latter half of the, the divisions where I, I seem to find a lot of different problems with it but again i think that there's, there's always room for for improvement in a lot of the different things that we do and that's I, that's why the pi exists <laughs> if you go if you go to the fight metric system you're gonna have just as many complaints i guarantee you yeah i think that that's fair I, you've been around the sport for a long time um when you see how the sport's covered do you think is there anything that you would change in terms of how media covers the sport as an athlete uh well, you gotta you gotta think. Of course, there are, but but I'm a true believer. You know, I was a basketball, football fan, and then in 1999, I found fighting, and then I kind of forsake all of the sports just to concentrate on fighting. It was the year-round sport, so you know, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it should be more prominent than it is, but I'm not. I'm I'm obviously a little biased. Well, I'm talking more about but how yeah. uh, about how people cover the sport individually. Well, you know, we had a very cool thing in that our media started out as fans and they were our friends, right? That was a very cool thing. But the, it's also a lot of, you know, kind of infighting with that, you know, and maybe these people weren't the best professionals. So a lot of people that got on the MMA media train early on weren't actually good journalists. They were just the person that knew about the UFC when most people didn't. All right, thanks, man. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, it's always great learning about uh, what the PI has going on and uh, the different studies you guys are doing. I'm looking forward to Volume 2 of, what's the name of it again? That's a great question. I've already forgotten. Now, a cross-section performance analysis and projection of the UFC athlete. Yes, I'm looking forward to Volume 2. Do you guys have a projected date for when that might come out? No, not at all. Um, so we, the, I'll, I'll finish up on this. The, the first idea was to wait. 13 months, 14 months, until we had enough data to present. And then we want to almost quarterly update that data and, and push it out, right? So we do, there's not a reason to wait to year three. Um, we want to tell everyone as much about the sport as there is to know as soon as possible. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, so for optimal as training. As you have enough data to present, you know, a, a new subset of whatever or present the perfect uh, – you know, performance testing for the MMA athlete, we'll, we'll release that. It's just about, you know, making things right. Well, I loved, I loved coming through it. I saw Clint and Heather uh, back at uh, the last event and, and mentioned to them uh, how much I really enjoyed learning 
from that particular uh, the particular volume. So I'm looking forward to more of yeah. that, and I think it's really great for the sport. That was Forrest Griffin. Some very interesting stuff from him about the Performance Institute. Some interesting statistics regarding the different athletes in the UFC. You know, right now it's kind of a downtime for the UFC and for uh, MMA as a whole. Not a whole lot going on, but I think business is about to pick up again in just a couple of weeks. We've got uh, UFC in Lincoln this weekend. Then another week off. You know, it's been, uh, you know, I'm happy about this. We've had three weeks off in August. That's must be nice for the employees of the UFC also. I know, I mean, I know that the, the machine is always uh, rolling, but it's good to see. So then you've got one uh, one event in Dallas. Then you've got the event in Moscow, the first ever event in Moscow. It's coming up quick, September 15th. Then after that, you got Sao Paulo one week later, and then you got a week off the first week of October before, as in the calm before the storm, before Khabib and McGregor, which is also coming up very, very quickly. How many days away are we from this particular event? Days until October 6th. 46 days away. Unreal. Really sneaking up on us. There are still tickets available for UFC 229. I mean, they'll cost you a couple foul, but... There are still some left if, you, if you're interested in, uh, in going to what is likely going to be the biggest event of the year in the UFC. I don't know how they could beat it unless their end-of-year card features Connor versus GSP or something along those lines, but I think that might be a bit of a long shot. You've got the uh, MSG card, Nate Diaz on the card, but uh, no main event still. I mean, time's ticking. Tickets for that are probably going to go on sale in the next couple of weeks, so we'll have to see uh, how that shakes out. And then, of course, you've got the event in Toronto in December as well as the year-end event in Vegas. So a lot to look forward to in the UFC. Um, I think that uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with UFC 228, Woodley versus Till. Because Darren Till, as I mentioned, it's, it's crazy how quickly he ascended to, the, to a title shot, especially in a very crowded welterweight division. And with an interim title in, in play with Colby Covington. So... Darren Till could be the next champion of the world at age 25, and that would be absolutely crazy. That would be perhaps the quickest ascent to a championship in UFC history. Well, anyways, we'll be back next week. I believe Joe will be here. Episode 53. Again, it's our one-year anniversary, so thanks to those who have supported the TSN MMA show throughout the years, and we look forward to more great shows, another year of uh, fantastic shows to come. Uh, Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening to the TSN MMA show. For all the latest UFC news, visit tsn.ca slash UFC.